Okay. Hi everyone and welcome. Um, I don't know what just happened there, but we will cut the start of this. Um, so welcome uh, to the Curious Geographer live interview. We are super, super, super excited to be joined by Paul Turner. And I'm really hoping that this will um, encourage a lot of you to get involved with kind of taking action against climate change and kind of seeing how you can make a difference. So um, Paul was a geography teacher. Um, for the last 10 years and he now works part-time as a climate educator and curriculum author as well as an air quality officer for SUSTRANS. Paul works with schools and universities um, from like primary schools yeah all the way up to universities to provide workshops around the climate and nature emergency and campaigns for radical school geography. So quite a few things in there so hopefully Paul will kind of break down a little bit of what he does and then we've got some really interesting questions on what you can do to get involved um, as I said, and kind of just how you can go the extra mile if you're really interested in this topic um, and yeah, how we can all play our part. So if I hand over to um, Paul, if you wouldn't mind kind of introducing yourself a little bit more um, to us and yeah, letting us know um, like what, what you do. Hello. Yeah. So thank you for that introduction, Ellie. Um, I guess I'm going to start by just saying it's really interesting. I think over the last couple of years in particular, my perception of how I define myself has shifted. And I think as it, like from a young age, we're kind of taught to almost have to have a single job or career and that that defines you as a person. And what I've realised over the last few years is actually what I get most enjoyment from is actually often my side projects and the little extra little things that I do around my core job. And so it was coronavirus that gave me a bit of a nudge and made me reflect and I, and I know there's lots of other people in a similar sort of situation and I realized that I wanted to to take up part-time employment so I had something that was a bit stable so um, I work now for SUSTRANS which is this organization which um, partly manages the national cycle network so one thing it does is it kind of it's it's essentially called the walking and cycling charity and it promotes walking and cycling in all kinds of places like schools but also in uh, workplaces and we work with councils across the country and my role in particular then is working in Sussex around air quality engaging schools in workshops and I've developed some curriculum materials around that and we go into schools run workshops and we put up diffusion tubes and monitor air quality and, and do all those sorts of things um, and then what I've been able to do with all my spare time is get more and more involved with uh, climate education so I've developed this climate breakdown scheme of work and some resources over the last couple of years that just sort of picked up pace so um, that's now been downloaded more than seven times ta seven thousand times across the world and like every week I get an email from someone somewhere like recently it's been Iceland where teachers saying you know thanks for these they're great um, and, and kind of having a bit of a conversation about them and then that itself has led to other things so I'm now working with um, a charitable foundation to develop a whole curriculum for we're starting with primary and then we're going to go to secondary but it's a kind of collaboration of lots of charities and that's something that we're launching in September. So, you know, exciting things come from exciting things and, and these things snowball. So, yeah. It all sounds fantastic. Um, and kind of hopefully we'll get like a taster of what you do with like different schools um, and things like that. So you say that you campaign for the climate and nature emergency. So let's start from the beginning. What do you mean by that? Um, I think people's initial reaction is to jump straight to like a, a climate graph and to show carbon dioxide. And actually, I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with a piece of A4 paper. And actually, a piece of A4 paper is an, an illustration of one of these key fundamental ideas. So I've got a question for everyone. How many times do you think I could fold this piece of pa A4 paper before I couldn't fold it anymore? So how many times can I fold this piece of A4 paper? I don't know if um, maybe. We can have that in the chat. I know it might be a bit slow. Maybe Ellie, you have some ideas. How many times can you fold? I feel that like people think you can fold it loads, but there's actually like a really limited number. I just know that because I think that, so maybe I want to say 30 times. Ooh, you must have a really big flat. <laughs> 
of paper. <laughs> no, it's seven. So six or seven folds. Yeah. Wow. You're already illustrating part of the idea. So wait, because I'm going to go even further. So this there's basically a physical limit because every time you fold a piece of paper it doubles in thickness now if for that physical limit and imagine if you could just keep folding this piece of paper how many times do you think you would need to fold this piece of paper before it becomes the thickness of the earth so how many times you fold this piece of paper and it becomes, becomes the thickness of the earth well, I mean, I got that super wrong, but we do have some people who did get it right. So well done those for kind of contributing on the group chat because you got kind of eight and 10, which is much closer to my guess. Um, so what is the question? How many times could it go? Just so people have had the question, we might be able to put on the chat before I manage to answer it. Can you repeat the question for me, Paul? How many times to fold this piece of paper before it becomes the thickness of the earth? So how many folds to get to the thickness of the earth? Mm, I've got an answer, I think. Oh, okay, that wasn't an answer, that was just a comment. Um, so, uh, Throw I another mean, number out, uh, any number. Uh, 1,000 okay, times. Okay, oh. so you, you've, I've dug a hole and you've fallen into that hole. Um, I set a trap, it's only um, 37 folds and it would be the thickness of the earth and actually to get to the thickness of the uh, Milky Way so the whole galaxy that we live in it would only take 83 folds and then even for it to become the, th the thickness of the observable universe would be 103 folds and the reason this relates to the climate and nature emergency is it's an illustration of exponential growth and how quickly things can get out of control but also what it illustrates is how we um, aren't, we don't intuitively understand how quickly things can grow out, um, out of control. And so what it illustrates is the idea that the, um, the climate and nature emergency isn't just a science problem, it's a perception problem. And so we aren't, um, we haven't evolved to intuitively understand these risks, these dangers that are um, that feel so much further and distant from us and also that can grow really quickly. And this also relates to the R number with coronavirus as well. And it's another reason why most people have no idea what that R number really means. And it's not their fault. It's just simply that we intuitively don't think in that way. So. The, the biggest thing to, to kind of get to grips with the climate and nature emergency, um, more importantly than any of the, the science and facts, is to understand human perception and to, to shift perception and to, to kind of use that as a tool. Now, now, of course, obviously, the numbers are important as well, but you can't just um, tell people the numbers. It doesn't suddenly change anything. So, yes, we have seen over the last 160 years um, Global sea surface average temperatures rise by 1.1 degrees Celsius. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are now 420 parts per million. So if you took a million molecules in the atmosphere, 420 of those would be carbon dioxide. And it sounds like a very small amount, but the reality is that actually that you only need a very small amount of carbon dioxide to have a really significant impact um, and to, to shift and change things. Wow, that's really interesting. I really like and the idea that it isn't just about the facts, though you have given us um, those at the end, but it is about that perception and how that can also make it an emergency if also we just don't maybe understanding the actions that people are having um, in today's world. Um, so linking then onto that, what is a climate, climate activist? Um, and a kind of second question, but hopefully you might dive into this a bit more, is what can students do to kind of be a climate activist or make a difference? So I think I've got a slightly flippant response in that actually we're all climate activists in that we are all actors, we're all part of society and our everyday actions are having an impact. So regardless of if we whether we want to or not, we're actually um, affecting the climate and nature emergency. And actually, the worst thing that can happen is just simply by doing nothing, we're on a path to this uncontrolled warming and kind of um, runaway climate change in this sense. Now, um, in terms of maybe what people might traditionally think of as a climate activist, it's someone who wants to communicate that sense of urgency. So the idea that um, we we the, the science is clear. There's um, 
someone called Dr. Emily Grossman, who communicates this really well. She says, look, the science is clear. We must act now that um, there is a planetary emergency. And so climate activists, I guess, more prominently are people like Greta Thunberg. And then there's a whole plethora of um, kind of young activists from all over the world. And actually, some of the most interesting are um, some of the, the lesser known ones, I guess, um, who are campaigning around these sorts of issues and um, it, trying to, I guess, ultimately change behaviours. So what we're trying to do is people are um, trying to communicate the situation in a way that then affects change. Um, and I've actually, there's, there's um, a quote that I've got from Margaret Mead, um, and it's actually been turned into a song as well. But it says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think one of the biggest problems with society is that we perceive a status quo. Um, and again, it's something that um, we look at in the AIM High course, and, and I think we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute, is that idea of there's something called ingrained normality or behaviours that people just perceive, you know, people think that the world has always been like it is. People think that humans have always existed. You know, this idea that actually the world is 4.6 billion years old and humans have only been around for 200,000 of those years, you know, in the sense of, of kind of how we think of people, you know, now. Um, so again, it goes back to that perception idea as well, though, doesn't it? In terms of it's trying to engage people in, in being an actor within society and I think that's what a lot of climate activists are trying to do is to uh, create a kind of critical eye and lens on society and how um, I guess things function in a way. Fantastic and I mean one of the biggest kind of groups of climate activists is Extinct Extinction Rebellion um, and sometimes you see them in the news and um, like people critiquing them for their extreme protests. So what do you think about um, the work of Extinction Rebellion? Does it, do we need to protest as much um, that it can be seen almost like in a negative way? Or how can we, what is the what, benefits of what? Yeah, tell us about your views on that. Okay, what's interesting is it's important to frame this within the historical context that throughout history, the people who have affected change to broad society, you know, if you think about gender, if you think about um, you know, human rights, black rights, uh, think about racism, those people at the time were criminalized, they were seen as outsiders within society. And again, I think we lose that context that often people now see these sorts of people and then just think of them innately as, as disruptive and a nuisance. And that's exactly how the people who we now put on a pedestal and we have statues of um, were seen at the time. So I think it's important to, to have that in terms of a uh, mindset. Obviously, um, you know, Extinction Rebellion is a particularly interesting organisation in that it's not necessarily an organisation. It's such a loose knit group of people who came together um, from all sorts of backgrounds and then managed to affect change at such a rapid pace. Um, and the speed at which it grew was was kind of phenomenal in one sense. And I think also the the the, um, the from a teacher's perspective, it was interesting witnessing that all happen. And actually, I took my um, at the time three year old daughter to uh, one of the first Extinction Rebellion protests and I had her in a carrier and um, I have to be honest, actually, there was a moment I was crying because I walked on to um, I can't remember which bridge it was. It was the bridge that they'd sort of put a skate park on and there were all kinds of trees just by Waterloo. And there was a moment there where I just felt like there's so many other people who feel the same as me. And it, and that, that kind of realisation that I'm not an outsider, that actually there's a community around this. And so I think that for a lot of teachers, it, the, the, the public um, rhetoric that had changed uh, over the last couple of years around this, you know, with Greta, but also with Extinction Rebellion and the, the way that the media and politicians have discussed and um, been part of that as well, I think has actually given a lot of educators a confidence to um, to be bolder in, in how they communicate these sorts of ideas. Um, and it's kind of been reciprocal in the sense that seeing um, change happen within that sphere, they've then wanted to change their own sphere. Yeah, you know, I 
I within within the school I was working in, I did a couple of presentations. I did an assembly all about uh, my experiences of going and visiting and witnessing the um, Extinction Rebellion protest and and kind of talking about that story and and journey, um, which which has kind of helped I think colour yeah the way that I then responded so I, what i would say though is obviously it's very easy to criticize these sorts of people they're very kind of disruptive in their actions but it's also important to understand the reasoning of why they're acting and behaving in that way and and it's interesting to see how when they have then been taken to court and then the criminal proceedings that have then followed actually how few of these people have then been um I guess sort of punished in one sense because actually there is such weight to the to the reasons why they're they're acting is a sort of proportionality in that sense um in terms of the scale of the emergency and social media media is huge in terms of also like spreading awareness um obviously we've mentioned Greta and you mentioned how there's lots of other activists who are doing fantastic things and one thing I get my students to look at when we start to look at climate change is getting them to research other climate activists around the world um so there's not a kind of like a single face which kind of people like almost like criticize the work of Greta being like she's the only face but how how would you um recommend students to go and find out about other climate activists is it to follow people on social media where would you actually direct students to yeah, I guess social media is a good way to instantly find lots of these people. And what I would say is, yeah, often try and find the ones that are more niche, that are not necessarily the most vocal. Um, but I guess also I would flip it on its head and say there's probably people within your own community who feel the same and that can have just as much an impact and could be just as interesting. So there's lots of organisations. There's um, a school sustainability network. You know, there are um, groups within schools, within communities, and, and see if you can connect with those sorts of people as well. And and because so much of this is, is about building human relationships within your local community. Um, and, and to do that, I think, is really powerful as well. Okay. And kind of going on about how um, students can learn more as well, you've... Um, be a creator of some of these amazing courses, um, a part of um, the climate and nature course from a ha- Aim High. Um, can you tell us what are these courses um, and um, yeah, a bit of information? How long do they take? What do students get out of them? Um, how will that help students in being climate activists as well? Yeah, so Aim High is the child of um, a guy called Matthew Shriven, and he's a sort of phenomenal character in that he's a sort of science communicator. He's, he was a musician, but he comes at this from such an interesting angle. And he's created these, um, it's a four part online course, but what it uses is really interactive um, presentation techniques. So you're sort of pulled along in a learning journey. It's nothing like that kind of passive experience of school where you sit there and you kind of almost feel like you're falling asleep, falling asleep. There's so many questions and it's so interactive that you kind of, you can't help but be part of the journey. But what these four lessons do map out, what is the current situation? And then actually looks at the solutions and looks actually how close many of them are and how it's not that necessarily we need to look at new technology. It's that actually nature is the most powerful solution of them all. And we just need to emphasize nature and then looks to us as humans and what can we do in terms of communicating and our own actions in order to, to to produce that but the course is designed for anyone and everyone I think is what we sort of say in that we've had people from like 10 11 all the way up to retirees who've participated um, and the idea is it's meant to be empowering so it's all about um, coming away with a really positive sense of action um, it, it's on a rolling basis so we're delivering it online each month and the four lessons are spread out over the month and anyone can sign up. Um, and we've we've kind of, yeah, we've been targeting um, schools and workplaces. We've had some really interesting workplaces in, um, engage. Um, only last week I ran it for Ben & Jerry's, the ice cream company. Um, and so all their employees in the UK have, have done the course. Um, we're starting to do it for local councils as well. But all of the feedback we've had um, it has been really positive and it's produced some really good um, behavioural change. So people feel empowered and they've chosen alternatives. So, yeah, definitely something I suggest young people uh, have a go at doing. 
So just to confirm, do they sign up for the, the whole month or can they just start at any time? Is there like particular times that the sessions are on? So there are three times within a week it happens mm -hmm. and that's partly to do with time zones. So we've increasingly been doing it for the world. Um, I think Wednesday evening and then there's a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening. But the idea is, yeah, you sign up for a month. So at the moment, you can sign up for uh, July because it's just finished the last run. Um, but the whole idea as well is it's not for profit. It's charitable. There is a small fee, but that's just to cover um, the running costs of it in terms of the hosting. But also the idea that we want to translate it for the world. So at the moment, we're going through the process of um, working with some organizations in China to, to translate it for a Chinese audience. Um, as well as South America and, and we're looking at other parts of the world. Wow, that sounds amazing. Well, so we'll put the link um, so everybody can see in the comments. But I forgot to say also, if anybody does have any questions, please do um, also um, feel free to write in the comments and then we'll ask Paul um, them as well. Um, so, I mean, we talked a bit about kind of climate courses, what people can do online with Aim High. Um, what reading is there any books that inspire you that also kind of can encourage um students to get involved in this topic i know you think you might have a selection with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i have too many books um but there, there are loads of great ones um one of the ones i was going to suggest first of all is is this one from uh, mark maslin and again mark and simon lewis from ucl they're some great characters mark has put together a really good list of um suggestions of what you can do and it's sort of prioritized in one sense um you know communication is one of the most important things just talking and, and starting conversations around the climate and nature emergency but obviously there's then things like your diet travel and where you get from um and then choosing not to fly so so those and that's also so that's all explained in this book um um called how to save our planet um it's also written in a really great it's written it's fully referenced every single sentence is referenced almost there's a couple of sentences that are not um but also it's written in like a tweet form so um it's really short and succinct um and it has some really interesting facts in it as well um that this is one I'm reading at the moment, which has I have really enjoyed. Um, and what it does is it's called um, Planet on Fire, a manifesto for the age of environmental breakdown. But it is all about what we need to do to change society, pretty radical changes that will ultimately um, affect the change we need. And, and one of the big messages of this is that um, in order to um, solve the climate and nature emergency, we actually have to solve big structural problems in society. So we won't be able to solve the climate and nature emergency if we don't tackle inequality or racism and big ideas like extraction and e exploitation that have been central parts of our history. We actually need to, to come up with a solution for those in order to solve the climate nature emergency and i think that's maybe one of the big takeaways from all of this as well is that we can't just solve the climate and nature emergency by focusing on carbon dioxide or certain bits of the natural world it's not about just simply taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and that will be the problem solved it's far deeper um and yeah that this book really brings a lot of that home um one of the other ones then I just wanted to to also mention is called um, Hope in Hell, because again, there's there's this there's a, there's a sort of balance as well with this that the more you understand, the more you can actually feel hopelessness and you can fall into a sort of pit of despair. And again, from a teacher perspective, this is often seen as uh, the big dilemma is that if I do communicate this in the urgency that I feel, I'm only going to make young people very sad and not very uh, happy about their futures. But what this book does is it says hope comes from a place of action and that the only way that we can be hopeful is by affecting the change that we want to see in the world. So not from some sort of loose sense of, oh, it'll just be all right, but instead by saying, look, I'm going to do this. And by doing this, that's how hope happens. Um, and that's from Jonathan Porritt. That's a really, really good book. Um, yes. <laughs> those look fantastic. And I think I will be getting those um, 
to read as well. Um, the and I showed one of the uh, the I think it was like the tweets by Mark Maslin as well as you were talking, which kind of shows like the things that you can do. Um, I did. Um, I just start, I thought about another question, um, but oh yeah. Um, when I was thinking about this, um, and as you said, like kind of um, hope comes from action. Um, have you watched the film Twenty Forty? And yeah. in you know you talked about how we have to solve other other things first, like climate change um, can't be solved without looking at inequality or the other, other issues that are going on in the world today. And that it's not necessarily about all like technological fixes. What in your ideal um, would you like to see changes being implemented in the next kind of 10 years and then maybe even, I don't know, another like 20 years? So would it be, um, so one thing which is going to really change um, where I'm living at the moment in London is that they have introduced the ULES, which has been quite strict for like all of London, um, where people are having to change their cars um, to be much more eco-friendly or people are just getting rid of their cars. Um, what and do you have an um, almost like a checklist wish list of if this could happen, this is what I would want to see for the climate? So I think because of my my rants, there's so many transport related ideas that also because part of our message is about making a happier and healthier world. So many of these changes actually impact on our well-being. And I think that's also a, a bigger message to do with the climate emergency as well, is that by changing these behaviours, you actually become a happier and healthier person yourself. So because also the way that we communicate the message, certain groups respond to certain approaches. And it may be that there's a group who will only act in a very selfish way and that if they then realize that it will improve their lives but so the bicycle the bicycle um is pretty much everyone's next car people are not gonna we can't shift to wholesale electric cars and there's a whole variety of reasons partly it's just simple space that if you have a petrol fueled traffic jam and you move it to uh, all those vehicles change to electricity, you then just have an electric fueled traffic jam. So it's more also to do then with our use of space. And we need to create towns and cities that um, put nature first, partly then also that has an impact, an impact, a positive balance on us. But also we need more shade because of changing temperatures um, in terms of levels of precipitation. We will need more natural um, nature within urban areas in order to absorb um, the excess rainfall. Um, so I think more people on bicycles, and that partly comes from behaviour change. It also comes from infrastructure and making it easier for people to do that. Um, I, I'm sure also that coronavirus has made people think about their travel and then also maybe their international travel. So the idea that um, people just shouldn't fly. So in terms of our carbon footprints, one of the, the easy ways that you can completely blow that apart is an international flight and buying a car because of the embed embedded sort of embodied carbon within the production of a car and then also through your flying. Uh, so I think they're big ones. Um, that but so much of that is to do with societal change and changing attitudes. So the idea that um, it's making people want to do those things themselves and realising why and those things are far more challenging. Um, it involves political change, you know, with, within the, that sort of sphere. I sometimes we learn about more like sustainable communities at school or places that are making the difference. Is there anywhere that you think this is a model of a place which could be replicated or somewhere where you just think they're doing this really well? It could be in the UK or outside the UK. So in terms of... Um, in terms of, as you talked about, the sustainable travel, um, idea. travel idea and having that infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the one that everyone knows of is Scandinavian countries, that they are so much further in that journey. But the thing that people need to realise as well is that's not just happened by chance, that is planned. And only 30 years ago, they were car dependent societies and that there's been purposeful planning that's made that happen. So we've got Scandinavian um, countries you know, um, that we can think of. There's also really good, um, again, it's I'm sure people are learning about this in school. You can think about Costa Rica as a country that wholesale uh, really have a focus on this. Um, 
where they're aiming for 100% of their energy coming from renewables. It's the same with Iceland. And again, it's to do with political will, that they have politicians who are making this happen. And I know that there's a sort of chicken and egg idea of, well, the politicians come about because of the population and, and kind of the, the relationship between those two. Um, um, I'll just say, if there are any more questions, we can, I'll ask um, Paul his final um, question from um, me. But um, yeah, please just do, do write them in the comments so we'll be able to add them in. So, um, and then also Paul, if you wanna tell us about anything else that you're doing or kind of tips at the end, that'd be fantastic. But can you tell us first of all, how did you actually get um, to where you were? And I suppose also, have you always been interested in the climate emergency? I know you talked about um, how going on the, um, the Extinction Rebellion kind of was all like an eye-opening moment as well, but how long have you been interested in um, yeah, taking action? Um, so I, I think in terms of personality traits, I've always been someone that's been, an, I'm sure anyone who knows me or works with me would say this as well, that I like to challenge the system. So I'm never happy with the status quo, that I will always um, be challenging. And I think that lends itself to this sphere because that's that's the sort of trait that's needed. I mean, in terms of the environment, though, I've always enjoyed being in the natural uh, kind of environment in in nature um, through expeditions and all those sorts of things. And then I did I went to university down in Cornwall, so I think I was quite fortunate in that you know that I was kind of so close to the coast. Um, and part of my undergraduate degree, it was. Um, such a fundamental part. Uh, so I did a module on renewable energy. We looked at um, lots of aspects of sustainability. That was really at the heart of a lot of my degree um, in terms of environmental management. What I would say though is it's 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 kind of come about by chance in a sense as well. That um, you know, being a teacher, I was exposed exposed to so many different ideas. Um, you know, I've worked quite closely with the Equality Trust as well. And, and um, we set up a program to create um, equality ambassadors or inequality ambassadors. Um, and it was sort of through that and through some other events and activities that then momentum built. I think over the last few years, I've just realized how powerful social media is as a tool, how you can collaborate with other people um, and how you can kind of build communities around ideas and, and build momentum as well. And I think that's something that maybe is, is a really useful takeaway for anyone that if you have an idea and you start to share it and then you can find like-minded people, it's so easy to use technology as a tool to then uh, grow those ideas. Um, and we do have a question that's come through, which is really interesting. Um, from Abjit, um, which actually has just been, but anyway, um, was a really interesting question because students obviously asked this at um, school, is that, do you think there is, I'm gonna slightly kind of change it, that do you think that it's everybody's roles developed and developing to make a difference for climate change? Um, and she has, it, Abjit has then replied, brilliant. Um, saying that why do some why do developed countries sometimes blame developing countries um for carbon emissions or climate change and is it fair and if there's a kind of fair fair kind of unfair part that say the uk industrialized first should countries such as india be able to industrialize or should everybody have the same kind of blanket rules on carbon emissions yeah so again, that's it's putting it in its historical context. Um, so the reality is that if you look through the whole of human history, the UK is fifth in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide it's emitted. Um, the USA is top and then China, uh, and then we've got European nations and all these other sort of countries. Um, but yeah, looking at the spread in terms of inequality is really interesting. There's a really good champagne glass diagram that the Oxfam produced that shows that actually the largest proportion of greenhouse gases comes from only the 10% richest of people in the world. And that actually it's the top 1% who by a long way emit the most. And that's where you can throw in some pretty interesting uh, statements and say things like, um, actually climate change was caused by a very small group of white uh, greedy men, uh, 
and there is a certain element of truth to those sorts of statements that we often talk about um you know the world having to respond to climate change or that it's humans who've caused this the reality is it's very small groups of people who have been the cause of this and to acknowledge that is really important because then you can start to think about responsibility you know if we associate if we kind of parallel with the slave trade you know um, and reparations there's an element of thinking about payments that maybe there's a responsibility of a certain number of countries for other parts of the world um in terms of helping uh, I'm going to say solve the problems that they caused in some sense, you know, that kind of um, colonialism and all those sorts of um, processes. Um, that I guess that question as well of the idea that any country should be able to develop and that that must be a carbon intensive development is an interesting one, because I think blanket, the easiest solution to climate change is to stop burning fossil fuels. And that's something that we could do overnight. I think coronavirus has shown how quickly we can respond to situations, you know, populations can change behaviours, we can accept a, a new normal in a certain sense. And that could happen with with. Uh, carbon dioxide and emissions um you know we know that the technology already exists it could happen it's it's more there's all these other systems around us that just mean we continue along this journey that makes it much harder to change but what i'm also saying then is that um there is no need for the development of those sorts of countries to be carbon intensive and i mean there's a whole other argument as well about do we need development in that traditional sense we're still very wedded to the idea of gdp and growth as an idea I mean, I, I just throw in another book, um, this one from Jason Hickel, um, which is all about the idea of degrowth, which is also a really interesting idea to explore um, that actually we have we kind of reached a plateau in almost one sense. You know, we've seen that in terms of life expectancy. You know, we've hit a peak. Our life expectancy is not going to continue to increase. Um, and so it, getting wealthier is not making people live longer it's not making us happier of anything it's actually doing the opposite and um those sorts of ideas are really interesting to explore fantastic um yeah i really like the idea that the the whole focus on gdp like what does that actually mean and it, like in terms of happiness and um like how is that actually reflected in our day-to-day -day lives as citizens in different countries um do you have anything else that you would like to direct students to um we've you've talked about the aim high um kind of pr uh, program that um students can, or um, everybody who's watching can get involved with get a bike <laughs> um what is there anything else that you'd like to kind of plug for the end for people or how people can get involved so i think it's it's Okay. There's a slightly kind of uh, philosophical element here as well in that I think realise your own human agency. We all have control over our own lives and we affect the world. We create our own futures. And I think once you realise that, that creates so many opportunities and, and it opens so many doors. And so, like you say, yeah, aim high course, get, ride your bicycle as much as possible, uh, refuse cars, but also... Um, you know, get engaged within your local community. And that might be, you know, it may be that people have already done this, but, you know, helping people in a way that um, builds relationships and builds communi community cohesion, um, you know, helping elderly people or helping, you know, vulnerable people within your own society. That is a way of solving the climate and nature emergency. And, and I think once you realise that and how everything is so connected, that, that um, is really powerful. Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much um, for being, I guess, answering all those questions um, as well. And also, like, yeah, I feel like I feel empowered to make sure that I want to do the AIM High course. But I think we'll get some of our um, climate ambassadors at school to do that as well. Um, but yeah, it's been really, yeah, I feel like it's been like a step forward into lots of different avenues, which has been really fantastic. So thank you for taking the time to join us on The Curious Geographer. Um, and just to everybody know, for two weeks time, not next week, um, the um, topic is on gentrification in South East London. It's been really interesting. We'll talk, be talking to Caitlin um, and about how gentrification is changing areas in South East London and some actually community groups um, who are kind of like protesting against it or keeping spaces safe um, for local communities as well. So have a lovely week, um, week, couple of weeks from me, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the summer and I will see you um, in two weeks time.